Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, a nationally ranked community-focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia, Northeast Tennessee, and North Carolina. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Been kind of a weird week on the women's basketball front for Virginia Tech. Men's basketball win last night in Louisville. We got some exciting football news to unpack as well. It's all coming up on episode 351 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. Welcome back in, Hokies fans. We record on Wednesday, March 6, 2024, from our studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Hey, remember to like and subscribe, refer the show to a friend as well, and head over to techsideline.com to check out our extensive editorial content. As always, the first month of your subscription is free. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. To my right, lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman. Across the way, our managing editor, Mr. David Cunningham. In the fourth chair today, senior staff writer Andy Bitter. And behind the scenes, producing the mustache man himself, Mr. Nick Brown. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. Tech Sideline podcast is also brought to you by the Hokie Way. In their second year in operation, the Hokie Way thanks Virginia Tech fans for their support of our mission to leverage student-athletes name, image, and likeness in support of charitable organizations. To learn more about us and the organizations that we support, visit thehokieway.org. All right, guys, let's not waste any time here. Ben, kind of a somber week. Uh, obviously, Elizabeth Kitley goes down against UVA on Sunday underneath the basket in Charlottesville. UVA ends up winning the ball game, and that has been the talk of the fan base. Whether you take it to social media, you're talking to your buddies, whatever it may be, what do we know? Uh, and let's just unpack this whole Elizabeth Kitley thing. Um, by the way, three-time ACC Player of the Year as well. Yeah, we don't know anything, and, and I don't expect to know anything. Um, I wrote a story about it the other day. Uh, Chris and I were talking about it in the office, um, just about what a player is and their injury means for the NCAA tournament, running through scenarios. Chris brought up Justin Robinson and and what happened a couple years ago with, with Tech. I looked at Notre Dame and Olivia Miles. Um, before we went on, Andy, of course, mentioned Jordan Travis in Florida State. Um, injuries matter. The health matters. And we don't know anything right now. Um, you know, Elizabeth Kitley went on a- the ACC Network on uh, on Tuesday night and um, you know said she's feeling good. And she's taking it day to day. She's rehabbing. Um, we spoke to Kenny Brooks after the game. He was visibly you know shaken. Uh, he said the only thing on his mind was was Elizabeth's health. Um, he also spoke to the media on Monday on um, a media call ahead of the ACC tournament, which began today. Tech plays on Friday at 1.30 against North Carolina in Miami or Miami. Um, well, we don't know anything, and I don't expect to know anything um, because Tech, this is a, Tech has to walk a thin tightrope here, um, like Notre Dame last year, who lost Olivia Miles in the final regular season game. Ironically, the Irish were the number one seed in the regular season champ. Uh, Tech lost Kitley in the regular season finale. The Irish played it very close to the vest, did not announce that Miles was out until the day before the NCAA tournament started. You got to preserve that top four seed that you have in the NCAA tournament. That's what, that's the big picture and if you don't hear anything about it that's why because tech is has to be very very careful about it but obviously wishing wishing the best for for her and her family and um it's a tough situation you never want to see that happen and again um you know kenny brooks was very emotional after the game and her you know if you watched on television you saw her parents were very emotional about it as well um just just a tough situation like you said three-time AC player of the year. She's a three-time KL scholar athlete of the year as of Wednesday morning. She's the greatest player in Virginia Tech women's basketball, maybe basketball period history. And you, you hate to see it. And, and hopefully she's able to get back at some point this season. Yeah, I hope so. Um, if she, if it's not a significant injury and she is able to come back at some point, no reason to risk her for the ACC tournament. Um, if it happened to be a significant injury, then uh, – well, I'm trying to think of all my years as a Tech fan. If I've seen a more devastating injury from a 
from both the timing standpoint and the caliber of player. Uh, if that, you know, if that turns out to be the case, I, I think this would be kind of unparalleled in tech history from a timing standpoint and, and a talent standpoint. So, uh, best wishes, uh, obviously, and, uh, it's tough for Kenny Brooks. Uh, you know, the, the good thing is, you know, tech plays on Friday. So you've got a, you know, an extra day, uh, from what you normally have. And, you know, it's just on other players to, to try to fill that role. As a true journalist, how do you guys kind of diagnose this, what what you've seen, what you've taken in? It just felt the way that Kenny goes into that press conference, the way that he was kind of broken down, he almost just knew, you know, it wasn't good. Again, we don't want to sit here and speculate, but as you just kind of unpack it all, what what are your thoughts on the situation in its entirety? Uh, I think Brooks has always been very close with his players is what it, what it seems like. And uh, so when him, for him, it's, you know, not just a player getting hurt, it's somebody he cares a lot about. And you can tell from his interactions uh, with his players, whether they're injured or not, that, uh, that he's very close with them. Uh, I would have expect the same reaction, you know, if, if one of the other important pieces had gotten hurt. Um, it's just, but it's, it's so different because of her, her talent level and the things that she can do on, on the court. You know, I was in JPJ, um, and it happened on the basket at the end of the court away from the media seating. And, you know, th- this is like Elizabeth Kitley. She's not a fast break player. She's a six, six center. She never gets yeah. out on the break. And, um, I, I feel, I, I feel for, for Kenny, um, you know, after the game, you could tell like he was, contemplating what he could have done different. He actually said like, man, like part of me wishes I had called a timeout when she was in transition because I never want her out there in transition because that's not like, that's not the type of player she is. Right. Yeah, and you wouldn't do that. It's an easy two points. Right. Yeah. And the chances so of that it's happening like, you know, are just and, so remote. Um, I don't think I, I didn't think it was, I, I didn't think it was good. Uh, obviously she, um, walked to the locker room. She came back later. Um, had the biggest, I mean, over a, uh, almost 12,000 people in John Paul Jones Arena, and she had the biggest ovation of the night when she came back to the bench. Um, she walked back under her own power. Um, you know, after walking off the floor mostly under her own power, um, she did not come back in. But then when when Kenny sat down in the post game, and that that's the most choked up I've ever seen him. And... He, he was emotional just thinking about him. He, he started by saying, you know, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about her health, but that's the only thing that's on my mind right now. And like you said, he's she's more to Virginia Tech than a basketball player. She is the greatest Virginia Tech basketball player. But what she has done to transform the game and what she has done for Virginia Tech, I think is, un, like you said, unparalleled. And... um it was not until I, I, you know, that that kind of gave me a little perspective. And then once I got home, I went back and watched the replay, and just to see her immediate reaction. Um, and and Ivan uh, Moraz of Russian Hokey was down right. under the basket and and got some pictures of Liz. Uh, you know, as soon as it he happened, he was the closest photographer to her. Yeah. Um, and that those pictures, I mean. It wasn't like she was screaming out in pain or anything. It's like she grabbed her knee immediately and just had this look on her face that she like she knew. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, Ivan got a good picture because he was facing the way she was facing towards the bench. Um, and then on television, it cut to her parents. And you see the emotion from their parents. It's like, like they knew. Uh, and then Kenny Brooks comes over. And they had a, they shared a moment and it's like he knew it. And again, I don't, I don't know what all that means, but the reactions just made it seem very, very severe, but we won't know anything until we won't have a, have a, a a little bit of an understanding until Friday tech plays on Friday. You know, she, I, I would assume she'll be on the bench, you know, but who knows again, Kenny's not going to say anything, but you, that's the first time we will get to see her actually like in a basketball environment. Again, she was on the ACC network, but just, you just hate it. It's just a sad situation overall. Um, she's one of three, three players in the country on senior day that like suffered a, 
a really bad, what looks to be a really bad injury. Mackenzie Holmes, an All-American from Indiana, suffered a really bad injury. I, Molly Davis, I believe, from Iowa did the same. Like, you just hate to see it. And what she means for Virginia Tech, three-time AC Player of the Year. On, on That itself is unprecedented. So, um, you know, Tech obviously still has a, a chance to do something special going forward. I thought Kenny Brooks' message to his team and to the media was really important there. And they've got the second best point guard in the country in Georgia Amor, but just really tough situation for everybody. Andy, what's this team look like uh, if Liz Kitley is not able to go this week and and talk an ACC tournament? Before we even get into the NCAA tournament, what what does this team look like without her? And what is the potential this week uh, down in Greensboro? Well, this week, I mean, David might better be able to answer that. Uh, You saw them at the end of the Virginia game. And of course that's being thrown into a situation where they're not prepared for that. They're kind of adjusting on the fly, but they become very perimeter oriented. Uh, and, you know, they had foul trouble that prevented some of the inside stuff, but I think it, you know, you, you remove that, you know, 23 point per game, 11 rebound per game presence in the middle. Uh, yeah. You're going to be a little bit softer in the middle of your offense. So, uh, and defense. I mean, you saw some of the Virginia uh, baskets they made around the hoop. I would imagine Kitley, had she been in the game, would have been a deterrent for some of those shots. So uh, you just become a completely different team. And I mean, it's unfortunate with the timing. I mean, the, the whole situation is unfortunate, but the timing especially because you were gearing up and this is where it was really going to count. Like the regular season's nice, but this was a team that wanted to get back to the Final Four and even possibly farther than it got last year. And and now that's in question. And it's it's a situation where it's, it's really tough to read the tea leaves on it. I think the only thing you can rule out right now is that she's fine. If she's fine, they would have said she's fine. She'd be practicing. She'd be ready for the ACC tournament. Uh, you know, if it's actually something like they're saying that it's day to day, they'd be saying this. If it's something more serious, you know, ACL injuries are common in women's basketball game. I don't want to speculate on what it might be, but you know, your mind can go there, they would be saying she's day-to-day because they don't want to affect their seating down the line because they have no incentive uh, to come out and be truthful about that. As a journalist, I don't like the fact that they have to be, (laughs) you know, obfuscate the truth like that, but it's in their best interest to do that. That's the incentive of the the tournament is to, to not necessarily lie, but not be completely forthright about what the nature of the injury is and how long they're going to be out. I bet you if Florida State could have gone back and told the world, ah, Jordan Travis, he's day to day, even though there was video of his leg snapping in half <laughs> uh, during that game, I bet you they would have done it because, you know, what what did they get in the end? They got left out of the playoff because they That's told right. the truth about this whole thing. So uh, it's just a bad situation. I don't think you're going to really know until they find out they're seeding in the tournament. And then if it's something serious, like, oh, yeah, by the way, she's out for the year. If it's that serious, uh, they would probably come out and say that after the fact. Yeah, I would expect, like I said, Olivia, the way Notre Dame handled the Olivia Miles situation. She still has not played this year. This was somebody who was an ACC player of the year contention with Kitley last year. She still has not come back this year. Um, funny, before, when I sat down, I actually saw a tweet um, from a Notre Dame reporter um, quote from Neil Ivey, the Notre Dame head coach, about Miles and 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 you know how she's not thinking about transferring and she's you know stick with it and you know Miles and Hannah Hildago, uh, who Notre Dame played la- or who Virginia Tech played last week. I mean that's going to be quite the duo. But the way Notre Dame handled it is the way Tech should handle it. And yeah, it's weird as a journalist because you want to know what's going on, and it's our job to report what's going on and what we know. But what Virginia Tech has to do is, like Andy said, I don't know if you want to call it lying, but it's in Tech's best interest to not say anything until after Selection Sunday. Because the minute something gets out, Tech drops, and you know I don't know how, how Tech's ACC, uh, ACC tournament will play out, um, but the minute Tech says something, Tech is obviously a top four team. Tech was vying for a potential one seed with Kitley. Without Kitley, you probably drop down towards the 7-8 line, despite your... I mean, that's like... Wow. It's not even that. It's hosting. Yeah. yeah if you're right. top four, you host. I mean, even if they, they drop you down to five, all of a sudden you have to travel yeah. for mm-hmm. those first two rounds. So, I mean, there's there's a financial incentive behind this whole thing yeah. uh, to be not completely forthright about what the nature of the injury is. Yeah. Playing in front of the home fans. I mean, we've seen Virginia Tech fans pack Castle Coliseum this year. That matters. That's the difference between the men's and the women's NCAA tournament is it, the, the women play at home. And... 
it, I don't want to say it's a guarantee that you make it to the Sweet 16, but playing at home is much different than playing on the road, and that matters. And so, and so, like that's the whole big picture here. Gio, you asked Andy about what it means for Virginia Tech this week if she doesn't play. Right. I'm very curious to see what Kenny Brooks does. I mean this this guy is somebody who he's a he's a terrific coach, and we've seen that. And again, he's got talented players. We saw Georgia Amor go out earlier this year, and Tech struggled a little bit. Um, but I think this might be, I mean, this might be a completely different shift because Amor's the point guard. Yes, she runs everything, but your offense is predicated and in, in, in centered around Kitley. I would expect Clara Strack to play a lot. Uh, I would expect, I'm very interested to see how he uses Strack. Does he play Olivia Sumiel at, with her at the same time? I would expect he probably does out of the gate. I, th- I would not be surprised if we see Rose Mishaw, who Kenny Brooks has talked about, and, and Mark Berman of the Roanoke Times um, a couple weeks ago had a really good piece, uh, or had a really good um, you know, part of his story about Mishaw and how uh, he asked Kenny about her and how she's um, been a really good teammate and she continues to work even though you know she's not necessarily doesn't have a big role on this team. She's a traditional five. She came from Minnesota and played that. Would not be so- shocked if she played. But how does Tech defend, right? Do you do you play a little bit more pressure? Does Tech get out in the fast break? Like, and like Andy said, Tech was kind of thrown into that situation. Clara Strack fouled out in in twenty one minutes. You know, she was already in foul trouble a little bit when Kitley went out. Kayla King had four fouls by the time Kitley went out. This is a fresh slate, and I think that bodes well for Virginia Tech. But again, very interested to see how Tech plays. It might depend a little bit on Miami or Carolina, who you get. You've obviously seen Carolina twice this year. You saw Miami once. But don't count this team out. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, we saw how good Georgia Amor was. She was 8 of 15 for 23 points after Kitley went out. She had a career-high 39. Like, if if we know anything about Georgia Amor, we know she's going to will this team as far as it can go. And it's going to take contributions from everybody. Matilda Eck, Kayla King, Carly Wenzel. A lot of those girls are going to have to score the ball and help Amor. But I don't think this is the end of the road at all for this team. It just, it's not going to be the team that everybody's been used to all year. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have just have one more comment. Absolutely. It'll be very short. Um, I, I don't like to give... Uh, any positive praise to you know one particular coach who has comments about Virginia Tech's defense, but Virginia Tech lost two games last year or last week, and they lost them both because they didn't play good enough defense. They gave up eighty to UVA, and how many did they give up to to Notre Dame? Uh, yeah, Se- seventy one. Yeah, they, they, they weren't weren't good enough on the on the defensive end last week. Um, too many easy drives to the basket. So if you don't have Kitley. That's where you have to improve. I yeah. mean, even you, you know, you've still obviously got Georgia Amore, but her two highest scoring outputs of the season, 39 points and 31 points, were both losses where Virginia Tech didn't play good enough defense in either one of those games. Virginia and Iowa. Yes, exactly. So that in Iowa, obviously, it's tough to play good defense on them because they have Caitlin Clark. Yeah, she but, can hit but, it from half court. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the main focus this week is – Figure out who you are. Use the ACC tournament games, however many of them there are, to figure out who you are without Kitley, just in case you don't have her for the NCAA tournament, and to improve on defense. Um, you know, some of po- Kitley's points will be made up just for the simple fact that Clara Strack and whoever else will be getting more minutes. Um, but you have to start to, to be able to pull it. I'm, you're not going to be as good without Kitley, but to have a chance to make that up, you, you need to play better team defense than you did this past week. All right, well, everyone's going to have their eyes uh, down in Greensboro for the ACC Women's Basketball Tournament coming up throughout the the rest of this week, really. Virginia Tech starts their action on Friday. Uh, There would be, after that, a semifinal Saturday and then then championship game on Sunday. Hokies start in the quarterfinals on Friday. Let's flip the script here and talk football because we do have some football news today. Gunter Brewer added as Director of High School Relations to Brent Pry's staff. This is an off-the-field job. Wanted to get Andy and Chris uh, both involved here because this feels like a big deal for the Hokies. Yeah, they. Uh, he was the wide receiver and passing game coordinator for Maryland, where he was making four hundred fifty grand. And so to to come on board at Virginia Tech is a uh, is a is an off field 
role in an off-field role, I think it's a pretty big coup. Now, you know, those off-field roles, their impact is limited to a certain extent. But as far as that role goes, Virginia Tech couldn't have hired, made a better hire here. He's a guy who has recruited at the highest levels. Uh, you know, if you go on 247 and look at his list of recruits that he signed over his career, I mean, you see names from, from ranging from Des Bryant to Mitch Trubisky. Right. Uh, Just a lot of really good players on that list. Uh, From a coaching standpoint, he's coached three Bolitnikoff finalists and two Bolitnikoff winners. Um, He's well regarded with high school coaches throughout this entire region. Um, He's well regarded with with other college coaches all throughout this region. So he'll do a great job there. I actually think Tech has upgraded uh, at that position, uh, Glenwood Fairby, who I think did a good job, uh, but he's, you know, he was, he was only going to be here for so long before he got back into high school coaching. And he took a job in, in South Carolina, um, and best of luck to him. Um, but I, I think, I think Gunnar Brewer is a, uh, is, is a really, really good hire. Um, again, that doesn't mean tech's going to start picking up, you know, five-star recruits and things like that, but you know, you can look at a wide receiver recruit now and tech's already recruiting really well at wide receiver with Fontel Mines. And now you're like, okay, We've got Fontel Mines, but we've also got this guy on the staff, and he's not going to be your coach, but he, he can all, but he can be a resource for Fontel Mines, and he's coached multiple Bolitnikoff Award winners and put multiple guys in the NFL, so you know he can help in in multiple ways. So uh, I, again, it's it's not like an off field position is never going to be like a high impact hire. Uh, you know, you can although I guess you could argue that that. Maybe Brent Davis was last year, in my opinion. Um, but a recruiting staff off the field role is not going to be like a high impact hire. But for what it is, I think this is as good a hire as Virginia Tech could have made. Yeah, you you look at his resume. He's coached everywhere for a long time. He's going to know some people. I mean, that's what that position entails is you have to know people and be able to relate to people. And, uh, and honestly, I'd like to talk to him just because I have a ton of questions about his time coaching Randy Moss at Marshall. That's all I care about. <laughs> I don't really care about the other stuff. As a Vikings fan, I just want to know uh, about Randy Moss back in the day. But uh, interesting, you know, he's leaving a, an on-field position at Maryland for Virginia Tech. I have to imagine significant pay cut to do so. He's, he's going to turn 60 in August. I imagine that's sort of just a you know, curtailing a lot of the on the road type stuff. Cause you can, this is a position where you can't be out on the road recruiting. So it's a, uh, uh, sort of a life balance type deal. I, I would imagine this is me speculating. We haven't talked to him uh, about this stuff yet, but uh, you know, like Chris said, it, it's a limited impact that you can make in a position like this. But if you're going to hire somebody for it, you know, hiring somebody with his wealth of experience, his connections, it's probably a pretty good hire. Yeah. And I'll also point out that, the Hokies strengthen themselves here, but they also weaken a regional recruiting rival in Maryland. So over the last 12 months, Virginia Tech has taken arguably Maryland's two best recruiters in Elijah Brooks and Gunter Brewer. So that this can, whenever you weaken a rival, you know, you strengthen yourself by, by default and they are a regional uh, recruiting rival. As always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. As our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring you all the great content across all of our platforms. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Bank with First Bank and Trust Company. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. We got anything else on football or is it time to talk a little bit of uh, men's basketball here, Just to go through the quick schedule, they start spring practice on Saturday, March 16th. Um, students are on spring break right now, but you know they'll they'll uh, they'll come back in over the course of the weekend, and then next week I imagine will be their you know for lack of a better term hell week. Uh, it'll be a conditioning week, okay, you know, to kind of get spring break out of them and get them get themselves ready for uh, spring practice. Uh, so yeah, the the spring ball March sixteenth. Uh, spring game is what April thirteenth. Um, Kamari Copeland, we talked about him last week uh, when we talked about him uh, squatting 635 three times, and we were very impressed. Well, he one-upped himself last week and did 655 four times. I can't even imagine. Um, <laughs> for the Virginia Tech record for back squat is William Boatwright, a former offensive lineman, uh, did 750 pounds. That was, that was even before my time as a Tech fan. So... 
I'm not saying Copeland's going to break that record at some some point, but uh, if there's anybody that's been in the program recently that had any kind of a chance at all of breaking it, uh, it would be him. There's been a lot of uh, jokes made about Virginia Tech football players and skinny legs uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Um, that's not the case with Kamari Copeland. This guy has, like, that's an incredible amount of strength. He's got some advantages because he's a naturally thick guy with a low center of gravity. He's not the tallest guy in the world, and it's easier for those guys to squat more. But still, there have been plenty of guys like that in the program throughout the years, and and for him to even be in the conversation with maybe breaking that record one day is uh, is, is one heck of an accomplishment. Didn't you this say- is coming from Chris. I've seen him put every plate in any time fitness on the leg press machine. So <laughs> if Chris is impressed by this, this must be a lot of weight. Just don't watch me squat. That's a lot different. Squatting's a lot tougher, man. It's a, it's a lot tougher. Best thing I ever did was uh, have, have Chris introduce me to his chest day routine. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun this past summer. We'll have to do it again soon. What you got, Dave? All right. It all also, I think, is important to note, like the football, the media schedule going forward. Um, I believe they're giving us uh, Prent Pry and and some of the assistants, and there will be some open practice once spring ball starts. They up. sent it out, and I have not even looked at it yet. Uh, do you have it, Andy? Uh, uh, I've got it. It's uh, not overwhelming amount of availability, but right. uh, you know, I'm always gonna stump for more than what sure. they give us. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Now we'll be talking <laughs> to Pry and the assistant coaches on Tuesday. Uh, next week, which maybe won't be as enlightening as we'd hoped because we just sort of we talked to all of them, yeah. except for Marv. Marv. Chris Marv will be uh, right. new to that. He was out of town the last time we talked to them. But uh, look for that next week. We'll have some yeah. some coverage off of that. Sweet. Well, last night uh, I was down in Louisville. Virginia Tech took down Louisville inside the KFC Yum Center. By the way, really cool place to see a game. It was it was a bummer to see it so empty. Obviously, Louisville basketball. Should have gone for the women's game. Yeah. Oh, I, w- I wish I could have. <laughs> um, eight wins this season, four wins last year. So far from what they once were. Uh, Virginia Tech looking pretty good, though, offensively. They've ripped off two in a row now. Got one more against Notre Dame on Saturday. Looking to end strong in the regular season inside Castle Coliseum. And, I mean, there's, a, there's an outside chance at a seven seed here looks like there is a, a solid chance in tech though avoiding playing uh on tuesday in the acc tournament so things shaping up to, to maybe end on a positive note here i think they're peaking offensively right now um, even in the games they've lost recently they, they've played well offensively uh they are 33rd in the ken pomeroy adjusted offensive efficiency ratings uh and it's adjusted you know to, to take into account the level of defenses you play and before yesterday's game, you know the the their, the opposing defenses they had faced, the ranking was ninth. Well, after playing Louisville, sorry, defense has dropped to fifteenth. But but uh, at any rate, the level of comp, that's out of three hundred sixty three teams, of course. So they faced one of the toughest defensive schedules in the country this year, and they've still been very efficient offensively. Uh, even though they they're, they're a little bit more limited in personnel this year than they have been in the past at, at times in certain ways, so I actually think this season is one of Mike Young's best coaching jobs that he's done at Virginia Tech in terms of just the pure coaching of the offense. He's he's always had a center who could step out and shoot the three pointer until this year, so he's had to reinvent the offense with to make it work with two traditional centers and. Uh, you know, they all haven't always been able to put three guards on the court, you know, who could shoot the ball like, like they have at times in the past. So I think the offensive coaching this year has, has been very, very good. Um, I just wish it was a little bit, wish they had a couple more pieces uh, because if they beat Notre Dame on Saturday, they're going to go 18 and 13, 10 and 10 in the ACC. When we did our preseason, when we, when we did our podcast to preview the season, I said, I think they're going to be a high seed in the NIT. That's what they look like, and that's kind of what it looks like they're going to they're going to end up being at this point. Um, once they lost Rice, um, I, 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 they went from what I thought was quite possibly an NCAA tournament team to probably being out. And over the course of the season, that's kind of what's transpired. Um, but they are peaking right now, and and you know they went in there and took it to Louisville which isn't a difficult thing to do, but it shows that their heads have stayed in it, you know, that they're, they're staying in the fight, so, so to speak. And, uh, you know, they'll probably beat Notre Dame at home on Saturday. I, I think that's about an 80% chance by the, by the metrics, um, in which case, you know, you're right, they could end up getting a, a seven seed. I would think right now an eight, nine is probably the most likely, which is, you know, not ideal. 
but at the same time, uh, it's a winnable game. It's 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 a winnable game, and and they they could end up at nineteen wins after the ACC tournament, which is what they were at last season. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the how good of defenses Tech's played. How many top ten defenses, Chris? Do you think Virginia Tech has faced this year? Virginia, yeah. Iowa State, two. Uh, Gio, you, Gio, you can chime in on this. Boise too. State, no. Mm. Uh, UNC, UNC, Duke, and, Andy. Do you want to chime in as well? No. A non ACC team. Oh, non ACC. Uh, was it FAU? Oh, or S- S- Auburn. 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 Duh. Tech has played four top ten defenses right this year. Um. I know, those. I mean, Tech didn't necessarily... Tech beat Iowa State and split with Virginia and obviously lost at Auburn and lost at Carolina, but that kind of tells you, like, Tech's played some really, really good defenses. Right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Tech's going to finish on the 8-9 line, likely. Um, the only way Tech finishes on the 10 line is if it loses and then if Florida State and NC State win, but you're probably going to play Florida State or NC State. You beat... NC State on the road earlier this year. You split with Florida State and should have won on the road. Yeah. Um, if you get up to the seven line, you're. I mean, either way, you're going to play Duke or Carolina probably if you win. So, um, but yeah, I mean, like Chris said, this team is is playing better basketball offensively right now. Um, I, I texted Chris this yesterday. Tech has shot above forty percent in the last thirteen games since that UVA loss on the road. It hasn't won necessarily every single game, but it's shot the ball really well. Last five games, it's shot better than 48% in every single game. This is a team that is is firing on all cylinders for the most part offensively. Now, it has work to do defensively, but like Chris said, this was kind of a we, – we figured this was going to be like a fringe bubble team potentially coming in this year, um, and that's what it's shaping up to be. If it can make some noise in the ACC tournament, okay. Um, but you've got op- – but like – you know, and Chris Chris ran the numbers earlier this week, and it kind of depends on what the rest of the ACC does. Tech has a, a good shot to make the NIT, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's good to see Tech playing better basketball lately. Um, and and I think w- when I look at like the last two results, right? Tech was down 15 to Wake Forest in that first half, and came back, and at one point led by 15. Like this is a team, a program that is not necessarily giving up. I think some teams. You know, with the way the season has gone, where you don't necessarily have a lot of NCAA tournament hopes, maybe you would give up. And Tech there's, came back and won that game handily. There's three key players on that team that were on the team two years ago. And so they've experienced what it's like to be on the outside looking in, and then all of a sudden yeah. you get on a roll and you're in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. So the, the Louisville game, I don't think there was anything crazy impressive. Though I, what I will say is um, – I think MJ Collins is playing really good basketball right now. Uh, I think he's finding his rhythm. He's scoring the ball pretty well offensively. He's playing good defense. He's distributing it well. Um, you know, he had a, a really good uh, pocket pass against Wake Forest where he drew the defense in and just a little dump off to, I think it was Melanchia Poteet for an easy dunk. You need him playing good basketball. And he's somebody that, like, Hunter Couture is going to leave. Um, MJ Collins and Sean Padula, this is like the – the backcourt of the future. And I think if you can get guys in to compliment them really well, like this is a backcourt that, that can be pretty good in, in the future. The problem is that there's just not that much depth. But you saw Jaden Young come in and hit, hit a three yesterday. I think Tyler Nickel, um, he hasn't necessarily been been uh, crazy hot since that Carolina game where he played really, really well. But um, but he's looked good in, in moments this year. Um Mike Young, we've we talked about before. Mike Young's got got a bunch of work to do once the offseason rolls around, but um, but I think you like kind of the way this team is trending up towards the end of the season and, and playing some of its best basketball. And just because Mike Young's got work to do when the season is over in the transfer portal, that doesn't make him any different than any other coach in the country. Correct. Everybody's got work to do in the transfer portal. Um, that's just the way the game is right now. Uh, you have to work hard to retain players, and, and then you have to work hard to sign new ones. And if you don't do those two things, it, you, it, you're gonna, you're gonna your product's gonna suffer for it. Um, I put some numbers up on the basketball board earlier today on MJ Collins. Over his last six games, he's averaging ten points per game. For the season, he's averaging six point seven. So his production is up over the last six games. His shooting percentage, 
He's still been up and down as a shooter in that stretch, but it's still been better. It's still better. Like I think he's up to maybe uh, he's up a little. He's up a little over 30% from three-point range when his season number is 25.8. And I want to say his overall shooting percentage is up around uh, 5% also. So he has been better recently. You've still got a couple of, you know, a four-point game and a five-point game in there. But overall, he's trending up. I don't want to say over his last eight or nine games, he's averaging 3.6 assists when his season average is 2.7 because he's been running – on the rare occasion, Sean Padula gets to take a break in a game. It's MJ Collins run, running the point. So his assist numbers are a little higher because of that. But he's, I also think he's playing better at his, you know, when he's not on the ball also. Um, and turnover's never been an issue for him either. Like, he's only averaging 1.2 per game. And that's the other thing as a team they've improved on recently is the turnovers. They, they, they had that stretch earlier in the season where – my gosh, I mean, it, it, just their turnover rate was so high, but they fixed that. And, uh, you know, specifically Sean Padula has played much, much better over his last four or five games. Uh, just the turnovers are, are down, and he, he's just become a much more efficient player. So when you've got your point guard has stopped turning it over, and then one of your other starting guards is being more efficient, that's why the offense is – And it helps when Hunter Couture can, like, just – Go off for twenty six against yeah, four. Yeah, that certainly helps. Yeah, too. second second road win of the season. We should add that. That, that is true. Tech Tech had not like the other game you mentioned. Tech beat NC State on the road, only road win up to yesterday, and had twenty turnovers that, in that game. That's insane. Tech yeah. won yesterday and only turned it over eight times. Yeah, they were, I remember. Uh, this has nothing. Well, kind of has something to do with it, but it's before y'all's times. But I think it was when when Tech first joined the Big East. Um, and I want to say it was maybe uh, like I was a freshman in college and the first Big East game they won that year, which I think was one of their like two or three Big East wins that, that year. They were so bad, but uh, they beat Miami and Cal- Castle Coliseum despite having 30 turnovers. In oh what? It was such a crazy. Game. Well, Miami had a bunch of turnovers in their own right. It was like whenever Tech like wasn't turning it over they had breakaway dunks it was like one of the most exciting games you could possibly see like the ball was but all also over the frustrating place. Ocean. yeah yeah that's crazy that's crazy so the men uh they, they gear up for notre dame on saturday and then after that it's the acc tournament next week uh up in dc i'm sure you'll be there i'll be there all right so so dave is gonna have yeah. you down in greensboro and for a, the women and that's then a notre there. dame team that's peaking right now yeah, yeah. they've won five out of their last seven yeah. they beat Since wake they beat before virginia tech like when Virginia Tech played them on the road, that's when Notre Dame started playing better basketball. They've beaten Wake Forest in that stretch, yep, and right some other we did. Uh, some other they beat another NCAA. Ter- well, Who hasn't beaten Wake Forest lately? <laughs> Georgia sure. Tech did last night. Yeah. Wake Wake Forest is, is lost How three in a row. Falling apart at the wrong time. I mean, the, the ACC they can sit there and talk about the the net manipulation that the Big Twelve and has, but I mean, every bubble team is just completely. Going down the drain here, right at right at the most critical time Wake, of the season. I mean, Wake Forest has played home. itself out of the tournament. I, I looked at Lenardi's, I think whoever he does the ESPN, yeah, Lenardi still. Yeah. He has him as the last team in right now, and that was before their Georgia Tech loss. Yeah, uh, Virginia. I mean, how many twenty point losses does Virginia have? Like I like, I guess they're still in the field based on twenty one wins and the pretty good ACC record, but man, that just does not look like a tournament team a lot of the time when they're out there. I mean, beyond North Carolina and Duke, and I guess you gotta put Clemson in there, even though I don't fully trust the Tigers in any sort of basketball scenario. And that's just an extremely mediocre conference. There's only three locks. I mean, Carolina, Duke, and Clemson. That's a two three to three seed and a five seed probably right now. UVA's, I use the bracket matrix because it takes all the online brackets that people do and combine them together. And they've got UVA as an 11 seed right now. Uh, and UVA, I think, is like last four in according to Lenardi. And they'll I mean, probably get in because they play Georgia Tech this week at home. They should win that game, although Wake Forest should have beaten Georgia Tech at home too. The, the thing is, like, UVA is going to be, what, the three seed in the ACC tournament? Yeah. They might not even make the NCAA tournament. Yeah, it's, it's possible. It's, like, like, like yeah. you talk about Pitt. I mean, Pitt lost by like, what was it, thirty three to Wake Forest. Right, right. Got, like, tournament teams don't typically lose by yeah. thirty Ooh, plus. UVA points lost by thirty games. UVA I mean, UVA's losing by thirty every game they play right now, almost. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, so, but, 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 but they're the but they're the third best team in the ACC, or they're their third highest seed in the ACC. Yeah. I mean, 
no way. Like, this is a team, worst case scenario, like, this league might only get three teams in the NCAA yeah. tournament. Which is crazy. That Their is best crazy. case scenario would be, like, a team like, Pitt or Wake Forest or like gets, hot, in. gets hot in the ACC yeah. tournament and wins it. And right. then they get the auto bid. Right. And I mean, that that could be the best case scenario for the league. Yeah. You guys uh, you yeah. guys are leaving a team out of the conversation. Well, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I am I, intentionally I, I not saying Syracuse, Syracuse, Syracuse here. here. I, ju- I think they scheduled. I think Bayheim left them one last gift and scheduled their, their non-conference like, like they still had the RPI <laughs> instead of the net. Uh, and I think they hurt themselves there. They're not good good enough in the computer rankings, but I think... Physically, if you put them on the court, I'd love to see. Like, I think their guards are really, yeah. really good. Oh my god! Um, Mint, Mints and Starling are two of the best guards in the conference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're, they lost they're, at Clemson last night, but if they would have beat Clemson, they would have had the four seed. In I the know, ACC. which right. is crazy. Right. And in Adrian Autry's first year, I, 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 uh, I said this to somebody the other day, um, and Felicia. Le, Le, Le Jack, Jack, she won ACC Coach of the Year on the women's side, and Syracuse finished. Third in the conference and was picked ninth, and she inherited a uh, a mess. Um, you know, just like NC State finished eighth and or was picked eighth and finished second. Um, but I, I texted somebody this the other day. Syracuse coaches now. If, if uh, I, I don't think it'll happen because um, Syracuse isn't. I don't think going to finish top four on the men's side. But Syracuse could have won the ACC Men's and Women's Coach of the Year awards. That could, like, I mean, they, like that Autry, could. Autry I, is, I vote for him. I, I'm trying to think who else. And yeah, you may be, give it to Hubert. You could give it to oh, Hubert yeah, Davis. Or, or, or yeah, because after Shire. last year, he's turned it around. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it would be probably either Hubert or Adrian Autry at this point. I'd have no problem with Autry winning. Yeah. I think he's done a good job. Are we Former overstating? Hokey, by the way, are we overstating how good Syracuse is? Are we talking about the same Syracuse team here? We're talking the about a relative 80, to the, re- to sorry, the rest of the ACC. Fourth in the net, two and eight in no. quad <laughs> one games. This is the Syracuse team we're talking about that is uh, sneaky would, good. I would just like to add. Gio, are you sneaking this into the podcast? I, yes. I have <laughs> yet to. See Say the word Syracuse. I simply you said go. you're forgetting about a team, and all you are bickering. Well, so. we knew, we knew you weren't on. talking about NC State, so uh. I, I don't. I don't <laughs> think they're. I mean, I don't. I don't think they're necessarily a tournament team. They haven't like done. I don't think they've done enough in terms of quality. No, they do got the one win over NC, or but, North Carolina. But they, uh, the fact that after the. After Monday, they were in fourth place in the ACC in Autry's first season. That's ridiculous. Relative to a, a bunch of other teams in the ACC, we've talked about. The last few minutes, I think Syracuse has done a really good job this year. <laughs> yeah. But the the, 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 the the ACC's problem, man, is that you like you've got from Virginia Tech in currently in eighth place, but even the like Florida State in, in uh, like you've got basically six or seven teams that all think they should be in that all have a bubble consideration, but none of them are really that good. Let me go on an ACC rant right here. Oh, oh boy. boy. Uh, <laughs> all right, this, up, folks. All right, th- this is from... Uh, you Andy's got to be out of here by five. You got a half hour. Let's go. Yeah, we good. Quick, uh, fairly quick. Let's not go a half hour. <laughs> you, you, you watch an ACC basketball game. I, I was watching the one, the Tech game last night, and an ACC commercial comes on, and it's like... We've won this many tournament games since Corey then. Alexander voiceover. Right, right. And we, we've won this many national championships and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, stop living in the past. Like, this is a message that gets delivered from the very top of the league is this is how good we used to be. And I, I just don't see them doing things to make themselves good right now or in the future. There, there needs to be, from the top down, there needs to be a, a league scheduling non-conference plan. If you're going to make the, the, the teams play 20 games and then tie them into the ACC-SEC challenge, when you know that also every team's going to play a two- or three-game tournament, like Virginia Tech only had six bye games this year, and they went 6-0 and in those games. But when you play 20 conference games, you leave yourself with no margin for error in non-conference. Uh, the, the Big 12 which is, you know, blowing everybody the way in the computer rankings, they only play 18 conference games. And then they have a scheduling, what seems like a conference-wide scheduling plan where everybody gets together and makes a decision that we're going to have the absolute worst non-conference schedule in the country out of all conferences. And that's what the numbers indicate. Like, they're well behind the other conferences in non-conference strength of schedule. It's like 250 Because they blow teams out. Right, right. So... And they get two extra team, two extra games against bad teams, so they get their net rankings up. And then when they play each other, 
Ever, but there's more quad one wins available That's for everybody. Genius. It That's is. Genius. It's smart. People can say, oh, they shouldn't do it, and, and the rules should change. What they blah, should blah, do blah. is they should well, copy it. Well, they were smart. <laughs> yeah. Stop criticizing them for being smart, right? And look in the mirror and make smart decisions on your own. That's what the ACC needs to do. Chris is one infuriated fan of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, you know, when, when we get... Uh, I'm sure we'll get Mike Young on the on the podcast again when uh, before next season starts, or maybe we can try to get him in this spring or something like that. But one of the questions I w- want to ask him is, how does playing a 20 game conference schedule impact your plans for non conference schedule? Like, if you had it to do over again, do you play that South Carolina game in Charlotte, or do you just to play a scrub at home and get the easy win and yeah. the and the extra? Computer points. Yeah, score right. hundred. Do you want, the metric? Do you right. want to yeah. play a team like Vermont at home when you can blow out a? Well, wolf? fortunately, they did blow out. Yeah, you know, Vermont. Not, not, but, but, but you know, it, it, you know, you saw Syracuse play some teams like uh, what, like Colgate and you Colgate be, plays you, them tight always. So it's right, right. So you beat them by eight points. You know, mm-hmm. and that and Colgate's like a hundred fourth, so that's a pretty decent win in the old RPI, but not in the net. Right, right? Yeah. you'd be uh, better off playing the 350th best team and beating them by double digits and taking right. taking the extra uh, net points that, that you get for that. So it's it's just a, I think the ACC, as usual, is is slow to react to things that are going on in college athletics. The one thing I want to say about ACC men's basketball is, I l- I, I think I like the future of the league. I think the the coaches that are in their first seasons, Adrian Autry at Syracuse, Micah Shrewsbury at Notre Dame, Damon Stoudemire at Georgia Tech. I mean, Notre Dame is hot lately. Syracuse has played good basketball here and there this season, beat Carolina at home. Georgia Tech, <laughs> Georgia Tech has beaten Duke and Carolina. In yeah. the same season, and, and Wake Forest the other day. Yeah, well, well they were undefeated at home before that. And that's yeah. and, 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 and I like I like the future. I like the new coaches, and I think, like I saw NC State fans on Twitter calling for Kevin Keats' job, but I do think that, like, you know, I think Miami's having a weird off year after going to a Final Four on their layer in Aga, um, you know. But but you need the good coaches to have good teams, and that's the tough part. Like you need Tony Bennett in Virginia to be good for your league. You need like Leonard Hamilton and Florida state have not found their form since they were a final four team in 2020 when the tournament was canceled. Louisville. <laughs> okay. Well, Louisville is its own problem, but yes, <laughs> like, like you need, you need Louisville to like be decent. But I, I look across the ACC and I think the, the new coach, the fresh blood, the new coaches that are coming in, like, I think they'll, their teams are going to be pretty good. Like, like I, I like what I've seen from them in their first seasons when they're kind of playing with house money a little bit. Um, but it doesn't matter if if you can't have consistency. And like yeah. I look at like Steve Forbes. Steve Forbes won AC Coach of the Year last year. He's I think this is his third year, not counting COVID, and he's he he will probably never make the end. You know, if unless Wake Forest does something special here, he will have gone three years and not have made the NCAA tournament when he's been on the bubble every year. I mean, are we talking, like, somebody mentioned it. This is like Seth Greenberg (laughs) 2.0. And I feel bad. He's maybe the most likable coach in the ACC, Steve Forbes. Um, But, like, that, like, if you're that close, you got to get in the tournament. But they haven't done enough. I think Brad Brownell has raised Clemson a little bit. Um, I think Jeff Capel has done a pretty good job with Pitt. They were a, a really good team in the tournament last year. And I think they're right there on the fringe if they can get hot, like Andy said. Um, but I like the fresh blood coming in. It's just overall the league has to play better basketball, and the league has to like. I get hurts your. I, I hate to say it, but like when Virginia, a team that is finishing third in the ACC, likely goes on the road and loses by double digits at Notre Dame, that hurts, man. I know Notre Dame's been playing better lately, but like... That was back at the beginning of ACC play. That was like January. You've got to have your best teams playing best basketball. And and that's just not happening. I I, want to be optimistic about the future, but but yeah, it's basically Carolina Duke and everybody else. Um, But as far as Virginia Tech is concerned... um, 
I think what Mike Mike Young has been able to do here at the end of the season, getting them playing good offensive basketball, is promising. And my my message to Virginia Tech fans would be: I don't care how like like I've seen, you know you see people all the time on the boards on Twitter complaining about MJ Collins, pl- complaining about Sean Padula. Right, that's the future of your backcourt. You need those guys to stick around. You need those guys to be building blocks. You yeah. can't have them go portal. You can't have them leave. Right, and they're playing better basketball lately. Mike Young is going to have to do a good job in the portal, like everybody else, of complementing them. You're going to have to replace Hunter Couture or try. Um, but I think Lynn Kidd and Elijah Poteet, like they've both been playing pretty good basketball for the most part lately. Um, the problem has been con- consistency. Tech has not been consistent. Tech two and nine on the road speaks for itself. Thirteen and two at home, but two and nine on the road. It's hard to be consistent when you don't have depth. Mm-hmm. Like Wake Forest is another one. Their starting five is really good, but like, they have nothing on the bench. They they have uh, up until last night they had and Tech won, so Tech is four and eleven away from Castle, including neutral venues. But up until last night, Virginia Tech and Wake Forest had the same three and eleven record away from home. Right. That like you have to win away from from your home venue. It doesn't matter how good you are at home. And um, and yeah, that that's my part of the the ACC sort of rant. T- take for this what you will. And, and Joe Lenardi's most recent bracketology after the win last night, he's got uh, on his bubble, of course, the last four buys, last four in, first four out, next four out. <laughs> and then you got the next set. Yeah. And Virginia Tech is in that next set. And this is the first. Tech is the last team listed. They are the last team listed, but they haven't been listed in quite some time. So just saying, if they somehow get that seven seed, Te- that's what the seed they were when they won it all. Tech's computer rankings are good. They're 50th in uh, Ken Palm. They're 50. Fourth in the net, I, I think. Uh, overall, their computer rankings, I think there's only like two teams with 17 wins ahead of them in the net. Maybe one. Villanova. Vill- Villanova. And maybe like three in, in, in Ken Palm. The, the, so computer rankings are 17 win team. If, 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 they beat, if they beat Notre Dame on Saturday and then they won their, win their first game in the ACC tournament, they're going to get bumped up to like that. Next four out group, <laughs> and people are going to be like, "So you're telling me there's a chance?" Well, teams almost never play their their way in like that, right? Like, right? Like when Tech made the tournament a couple years ago, it had to win the ACC tournament. Right. Like you look at where their seeding was. If they had not won that game and beaten Duke to get the auto bid, they weren't getting in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you saw it with Buzz Williams at Texas A&M a couple years ago, where they made that run to the title game. And they're there, and they lose the title game. Everybody's like, "Ah, oh, hottest team in the country, Texas A&M. They leave them out. And then Buzz went on a Buzz-like rant, which uh, was pretty enjoyable to watch from afar. Uh, so, I mean, I feel like the, the tournament field is kind of set – Barring these teams that get yeah. the auto bid, yeah, I mean, like you, you don't see like oh they won two in their conference tournament, so they're in all of a sudden. Like even if Tech were to to get a, you know beat uh, the eight nine, say they're in the eight nine game, they they win that game, that's not a game that puts them in the tournament. Even mm-hmm. if they beat North Carolina after that, that wouldn't put them in the tournament. They'd have to beat another team of that caliber, which would be Duke which would be in the title game, which would right. be winning the whole thing. So short of winning the tournament, Tech's, I don't think Tech has any chance to yeah. get in. Uh, but it's just this time of year, I, I feel like we always hear, like, they got to win two, they got to win three in the tournament. It's like, it, in most cases, you have to win the tournament or you're not going to play your way <laughs> It in. could be my imagination, but it, it kind of seems to me like the conference tournament games don't matter as much as they used to. Um well, I feel like they they have the field set. They're like, well, if, uh, yeah. if this team would have won and got the auto bid, we would have put them in and taken this team out. No, but other I, than that, they like we're, we got the work done yeah. on Saturday night. I, I feel, I, right. I feel like a conference tournament game should count the exact same as a regular season game. Uh, but now I feel like they don't count as much well, sometimes. I think the tough part is that, and it all goes back to your conversation about what you do in the non-conference. It is so hard to... To move up and down in the net after December because you play 12 plus games and you're, in terms of the net, your efficiency, like that's what you are. And you basically, it's like, oh yeah, Virginia Tech is a top 50 team in the country, but un- unless you, unless you like go on this tear, unless Tech would have beaten Carolina and Duke, right? Tech's not cracking probably the top 35. That's just who Tech is. And 
And and that's why it's like I, I think it used to be like, oh, we had you you would have so many teams on the bubble and it would come down to what you did in the last week of the season. And now it's you've got so many teams on the bubble, but like Andy said, it's pretty much set by the time the regular season well, is they used done. To have, they used to have like a last 10 component, right? I think that they would yeah. consider like how and, you're playing at the end of the year. And, and one year they even switch it to a last 12. And I'm like, oh, come on. That's almost half the season. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's just interesting the way, like the metric, the way the metrics have changed and ACC teams need to take advantage of that. But also like, you c- yeah, it's weird. Cause it's like, you, once you get to January, it's like kind of like you are what you are at that point. Yeah, the, the net doesn't change that much late in the season unless you blow somebody out. Like you, when Tech blew out UVA, they jumped up like nine or ten spots. Yeah. But like but then Tech e- even lost. last night, a 16-point win only moved them up three spots. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I wanted to mention to everybody as well that uh, Tech softball has been dominant. They swept Notre Dame last weekend here in Blacksburg. They head to Louisville, take on the cards uh, this upcoming weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then uh, they actually had their game today canceled against Eastern Kentucky. Baseball uh, had the same difficulty with the weather. They were supposed to play host to Binghamton at English Field today. That one got canned. Instead, the Hokies will regroup and get ready for Notre Dame uh, at English Field this upcoming weekend. So they open up ACC play. Fun series coming up from English. Encourage everyone to come on out and uh, and check it out at Atlantic Union Bank Park. Uh, and with that being said, wanted to ask you guys what else is coming up on Tech Sideline this week. Don't forget wrestling, man. Oh, that's true. We got ACCs coming up for the wrestling. That's uh, that, not my. I will admit, not my biggest area of expertise. So I will let you guys kind of take the reins on that. I know Jack will have us covered for that. Yeah, Jack. Uh, yeah, we, we're going to be all over the place. This is kind of like crossover season times three for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, Chip. Uh, I have a Louisville plays today against uh, when when this recorded on Wednesday against top 25 team in Arizona chip sent me a story I've already edited it I'm gonna add a little bit like you know just tweak the records and stuff after today's game and we'll run it tomorrow morning um, his preview of the Louisville weekend he'll be there he and Sam Mostow will have us covered Razan Umarani will have us covered uh, he'll have a baseball preview on Thursday he'll have us covered English all weekend uh, I will be in Greensboro and Jack Brizendine will be down there with me um, up until Sunday if Tech can make it to Sunday then Andy will come down and join me uh, and Jack will go have us covered in uh, in Chapel Hill I see out of the corner of my Nick Brown is raising his hand because Nick will also be down in Greensboro with me and Ivan will as well. So we'll have a, a, a good crew down there at the AC women's basketball tournament. Jack will have us covered again on Sunday in Chapel Hill at the AC wrestling championships. So um, I'm going to write one. I'm going to go down to Greensboro tomorrow on Thursday. And depending on what happens in the Carolina Miami game, write up something, to, a, a little preview. We won't, again, we won't know anything on Kitley, but just to get, opposing coaches perspective um on how you play tech without kitley so that's what's coming up for me like andy said there's football stuff coming up next week it's a lot of traveling for you guys um and dc next week yeah dc next week i'll be at champs or pks (laughs) 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 Um, Um, as far as content i'll write a football article tomorrow going over some more of the gunter brewer stuff and also some uh spring practice stuff strength conditioning stuff andy you're in the middle of your spring preview countdown yeah Yeah. we got the finished up the offense today try to squeeze in the defense and special teams before tuesday next week when they uh kick it off with the press conference sweet well i i guess if we're talking wrestling and everything too got to say the women's lacrosse team won today against elon 10 goal it. victory uh from thompson field so always good to see a Hokies w i think that puts a wraps on uh, episode 351 thanks so much for joining us today again stay tuned on tech sideline a lot of big content coming out uh, because it's a crazy busy week across all of uh, virginia tech athletics for nick brown behind the scenes for andy bitter for david cunningham chris coleman i'm giovanni heater saying so long from blacksburg and as always we'll see you next week